Welcome to the Birch Bioinformatics System. My name is Brian Fristensky, and I'd like to introduce you to Birch, which has been developed in my lab at the University of Manitoba. Birch is a collection of hundreds of tools spanning many areas of genomics, including basic sequence tasks, multiple alignment, phylogeny, genome and transcriptome assembly, blast searches, sequence retrieval, and a lot more. All of these tasks are unified through our unique BioLegato graphical interface, which we'll talk about uh, at some extent uh, in just a moment. But uh, I do want to mention that uh, one of its features is that if there's a program that you really want that isn't in Birch, BioLegato is designed to make it easy to add that program to your local Birch site. And then finally, let me just mention that Birch scales from uh, desktop uh, PCs for small tasks like bacterial genomes all the way up to high-performance computing clusters for large genomes and transcript. Think of BioLegato as a program that runs other programs. There are many BioLegato interfaces, each specialized for running tasks on specific types of data. For example, here we see BioLegato interfaces for handling blast hits, multiple sequence alignments, uh, doing keyword queries at NCBI, and for working with DNA sequencing reads for genome or transcriptome analysis. When we run a program from one BioLegato interface, the results are sent to a new BioLegato interface appropriate for working with the output of the previous step. This, in turn, lets you discover new things from the results and then go on to the next step. We call this process ad hoc pipelining. Birch runs hundreds of tools through BioLegato. Today, we'll demonstrate just a few. So as an example, our goal will be to retrieve dirigent proteins from uh, plants. And so uh, the original dirigent proteins are cloned under the name DRR206, but now are known as dirigent proteins. And to get those specifically from the flowering plants, we're going to set the organism field to Magnolia phyta. And then we'll have the search look for either of these two terms. So anything that matches Magnolia phyta and one of these other terms will be found and retrieved from NCBI. So uh, we'll run the search, and there we go. There are the, uh, there's only a few sequences actually that, that match those criteria, but remember this was uh, originally cloned in P under a specific name. So um, <clears throat> if we wanted to get more examples of these from uh, many other plants, we would then have to retrieve the sequences and uh, do a blast search. So that's what I'm going to do is just retrieve those sequences using protfetch, and the output will go to a BL protein uh, window. So the BL protein is a biolegato application specifically for working with proteins. So to do our blast search, we'll just choose one of the proteins. And we have a couple of options because we'd either, we could either do the search at NCBI or on a local copy of the BLAST databases. Since we happen to have a local copy of the uh, non-redundant nucleotide database, that's what we're going to search using tblastn. So there is the menu that lets us run tblastn. You can see that we've set the database to non-redundant nucleotide. And we will uh, launch the search just using the Run button. And I'm going to edit out the time that it takes to um, run the search. So we'll uh, return as soon as the, uh, as the search is uh, completed. So as you can see here, we've got our blast out in two different forms. One is the familiar uh, web page output showing all of the hits, both as a list and also the um, uh, alignments of the hits. And of course, one of the nice features that you can click on any uh, of the hits and have a look at the uh, sequence at NCBI. The other way we get the output is in BLN Fetch, which is yet another BioLegato application, this time uh, for working with blast hits. So uh, if we just um, scroll in a bit, you'll see that 278 hits were found. And then um, going to the uh, uh, other lanes or other columns here. We have the title, of course, which gives us an idea of what we're looking at, the genus and species name. One of the important ones is the subject length. And the reason this field is important is that a lot of times we only want to retrieve gene-sized features. 
And so if you have a look down this list, you'll see there are quite a few sequences that are, are probably back clones or chromosome fragments or something that would make, uh, make it a little more complicated to work with these. So what we're going to do is to sort this um, entire table on the basis of the ninth column, column I, which is size. And we'll go for an ascending sort and then uh, we'll get a new window with all of the same uh, sequences, but now sorted by size. So again, if we go to column I, you'll see that the um, uh, subject length column, as we get down near the bottom, we have all of these bigger uh, sequences that we want to ignore. So what I'm going to do is to just select the, the gene-sized fragments, and then um, uh, those are the ones that we're going to retrieve. <clears throat> so that should select everything, and in order to retrieve them, we run seek fetch. That will retrieve the sequences from NCBI uh, to our, our working uh, screen. So we'll run that, and we'll get our output. So there is the new window. Now, <coughs> this is BLDNA, uh, which makes sense because these are DNA sequences. So let's say that we, since our stated goal was to get a multiple alignment to the proteins, we first have to get the amino acid sequences. So we're going to select all and then run a program called Features to cut out the coding sequences. So we now, <coughs> we now click on Run. The output will pop up in a new BLDNA window. And you'll see that um, all of these begin with ATG. And so uh, that is, is what we expect of, um, of <coughs> Uh, coding sequences. If I want the proteins, I'm going to select all and then run the ribosome protein to translate them. So the output will go to a new DBL protein window this time. We've seen BL protein before. Now note, by the way, we have a lot of sequences here. It's probably over, over 200 sequences. So you have the ability to work with a large number of sequences at any given time. So let's run MAFT and we'll uh, do a fast progressive alignment using MAFT. Oh, and there's our, our alignment popping up almost right away. And so, uh, again, this is a multiple sequence alignment, so we have a lot of, of uh, uh, sequences in this, in this window. You can see a lot of polymorphism at the uh, end terminus of the proteins and then a conserved core inside. So maybe one final thing to show is that we could take this alignment and uh, uh, use other tools, such as, for example, uh, JAL View, which is a very nice multiple alignment tool that uh, works with multiple alignments and gives you a great deal of information on the alignments that you, uh, that you have. And so there is our alignment now in uh, uh, JAL View. And for example, we can do things like look at the uh, conservation of sequences, of uh, uh, the conserved regions, the, the non-conserved regions. We can do uh, principal component analysis and, and many other multiple alignment tasks. So that completes what I'd like to show you, just to give you an idea of the very smooth flow of data uh, that we like to refer to as ad hoc pipelining. Anyone who's ever assembled a genome or transcriptome or done differential gene expression with RNA-seq reads knows that the pipeline includes many different programs for read trimming, error correction, quality control, assembly, read mapping, and so forth. Every one of these steps requires that you install a program, and that's usually very complex, and even more complex is the learning curve for every single program you have to use. BL Reads is a bioligato application that seamlessly integrates all of these tasks and runs the programs for you, letting you evaluate your results at each step and then experiment with different programs and different parameters to achieve the best result. A quick overview of the de novo transcriptome assembly process starts with your raw sequencing reads, which typically come from a sequencer with very long file names, and these names are very awkward to use. BL Reads has unique tools for creating symbolic links to these files with short, easy-to-use names that makes all the rest of the steps easier. 
As we go through the steps, you'll see how BL Reads makes it convenient and organized. In particular, BL Reads has a tool called Guest Pairs that, for pair end reads, usually figures out which two files should be paired together for each treatment, replicate, and time point. We'll show you how to generate quality control reports, trim reads, correct reads, assemble a transcriptome, and rate the quality of the final assembly. So here's the uh, BL Reads application, and it's designed pretty much like a file manager or, if you're a Mac user, uh, the Finder. So it shows you the files in the current directory. In each case, these are Illumina uh, uh, sequencing reads in paired end format. So there are two um, time points, 18 hours and 24 hours, and then three replicates. And uh, then, of course, for each time point and replicate, there's a, an R1 and R2 file that refers to the forward and reverse reads. So this is really complicated uh, in the way the file names are set up. So one of the things I've found is that by making simpler file names, it drastically uh, simplifies all of the downstream process. And so that's what we're going to do. We're not actually going to change the names of the files. Instead, we're going to create symbolic links to these files so that we can work with the links as if they were the files. Each link will point to a file. So just to give you, uh, first of all, an idea of how BL Reads works, we have various file tasks, and in a moment we're going to create symbolic links. And you can do other things like compressing files, decompressing, deleting files. All of the tasks you might do on reads, like getting statistics from the reads, trimming them, correcting them, etc., can be done in the reads menu. And then for assembly, we have a genome assembly menu that runs different genome assemblers, a transcriptome assembly member that uh, a menu that assembles transcriptomes and also generates gene expression data using the HiSat string tie pipeline. And so you have all of these tasks at your disposal in a single application. So the uh, best example is to just start with a single uh, file, and this is the tedious part. We're just going to uh, breeze through this. We'll just take the first file, which is the 18 hour time point replicate number three. And if we want to uh, get rid of the beginning of the file name, then the way to do that is to um, select the whoops, the uh, beginning of that name and then paste it into the target pattern to match. So that is what the uh, link program will do. It will find files with that name and replace that part of the name with, in this case, just the empty pattern. You'll see what I mean in a moment. So now there is the link to the file we just changed. It's got a much shorter name by getting rid of the beginning part of that name. So we can repeat the process for the next uh, file, which is going to be the R2 file, and all we have to do there is just change R1 to R2, and we've done the same operation on the other file. So I'm going to go through this process uh, and then just skip right to uh, the end when we've got all of these names changed. So now we can see the result where all of the original files with these long names have symbolic links. And you can see, for example, the links have an L in the uh, file type field, whereas the original files have an F, meaning that they're files. So from now on, in all the downstream steps, we can just work with these easy names. And all of the new files we create will have these simple names, but we'll always be able to map back to the original files. Now, the last thing I want to do is just get it rid of uh, one superfluous part, this underscore S5, that we don't need, and that can be done with a global rename. So we'll just uh, put in underscore S5 and uh, run that. Now we've got the short, convenient file names to use. So just to make it absolutely clear what we've done, we've zoomed out, and then I'm just going to uh, get a list of files at the command line so that you can see the original file names, long file names in red, and in blue, the symbolic links to each of those files. So once again, we're pointing to files. We haven't actually renamed them, but these new names are going to get reused uh, in all of the downstream tasks. So now that the tedious part is out of the way, we can have some fun with these files. 
So one of the first things you usually want to do with your reads when you get them is to learn something about them. So the first program we'll run is SeekKit Stats. So SeekKit is a nice uh, program that does all sorts of great things with reads. And um, we will uh, just run SeekKit to get a report on all of the sequencing reads in all, um, I guess, uh, 12 of these, of these uh, files. I've edited out the time that it takes. Uh, there are the names of the read files, and we have the important sequence statistics for all of these. Uh, so each of these read files contains around 2 million sequences, and then the total length of the reads, these are 100 base reads because it's RNA sequencing, is uh, in each case about a quarter of a million uh, nucleotides each. Now this is only 5% of the actual data set. Just to make things faster, we're using a, a subset of the original data set. And so uh, that's one bit of information we might get about sequencing reads. The next thing that we can do is to run FastQC. And FastQC is a program that generates reports on the sequencing reads um, that give you a great deal of information on the quality. And so what I'm going to do next uh, is actually set uh, an email address. Uh, I'll just put a fake one in here. Just to uh, demonstrate how things would run if we, were, if we were going to get notification by email. You could have it go to your phone and then if you were in the lab you would um, you would be able to get a notification whenever the uh, the next task was done. So a lot of the of, I'm just going to turn this off to, to start running the programs though. Uh, a lot of the uh, in fact most of the tasks that are done in um, BL reads can be automated so that you can run the task and come back later and uh, get on to the next task. This is the nature of working with uh, genomics data is that it's really big data and so uh, very often uh, things that you're going to do will take a while. If this was the complete data set we would um, we would be uh, probably taking uh, an hour or more to generate the fast QC reports for all of the reads. So for any file I can choose I can select the file and then choose view file to look at the file in a uh, web browser. And so here's uh, one example for the uh, one 18 hour time point replicate one uh, R1 reads. We have a graph showing the um, quality as a function of position in the reads. For, for, for every one of these hundred positions we see that the, the beginning is very high quality, the quality goes down a little bit, but it still stays mostly in the acceptable range. We can see uh, many other uh, things, whether adapters are found, if there are overrepresented uh, sequences in the um, in the read. So there's quite a large number of things you can learn from the fast QC uh, output. Once you've had a chance to assess the quality of your raw reads, the next step is to trim the adapters. Uh, used for sequencing off of the ends of the reads. And in some cases there might also be read-through adapters uh, by uh, when you have short reads. So in order to do this we have to select the read files and the easiest way to do that is using the guest pairs program. So guest pairs is a Python script that uh, looks for a pattern that distinguishes the left read pairs from the right read pairs. In this case it's R1 and R2 and then groups files based on uh, being identical except for those strings. So we're going to check only the files that actually have sequencing information in them. So that will be files that have the file extension, in, the, in this case fastq.gz uh, would be a good example. And we run guest pairs and a new BL reads program comes up uh, or uh, window comes up. Now you'll notice that we get both the original read pair files as well as the symbolic links and so we only need the symbolic links. 
uh, by the way, take a, take a moment to just appreciate the convenience of having this step because for most of the programs that work with reads in any way at all, you've got to uh, do a lot of work setting up the input files to group these read pairs. So here, guest pairs has done that work for us and if I want to use the symbolic links to uh, designate what the file names are going to be, then I just select the symbolic links and I ignore the actual read files. So we want to trim the reads and there's two choices, trim galore and trim matic I'm just going to show trim matic right now. And the first thing to note that is that the corrected reads or trimmed reads will be written to a new directory. So this will be a directory called reads.trimmatic that is in the parent directory from the, where we are right now, which is the reads directory. So this way, as you go through each step, you'll have the results from one step in a separate directory from the results in the previous step. And that's very useful. Uh, half of bioinformatics is, is organization. So we need to uh, be able to organize our, our tasks. Um, I'm going to just re reiterate that if you want, you can be notified of the um, results uh, finishing up by email. But let's go on to the parameters. So uh, in, in um, Trimmatic, uh, the Illumina Clip parameter is always set. Uh, you can look through the documentation to see that. But what I will do is at least set to true the parameter keep both reads of read throughs. So that means that if there is a read through, um, either you keep bo both pairs even though they don't have any data or get rid of them. Having unpaired, uh, one pair missing in paired end files messes up certain uh, assembly programs. So this is just a safer thing to do. For quality, uh, we're going to set max info to yes. So that is, um, used for uh, deciding what nucleotides to delete in three prime trimming and then speaking about trimming we can go to the cropping menu and we're going to crop bad reads from either the leading or the trailing um, uh, uh, ends so bad is required as anything lower than 20 which is actually a pretty low quality score and then finally, you should always uh, set the last parameter, min len. Uh, in this case, uh, we want to delete reads or discard reads less than, uh, in this case, 100 nucleotides long for RNA-seq data. So I'm going to launch the program, and then we'll uh, see the output pop up in a new BL reads uh, window. The output from Trimmatic pops up in two windows. First, we'll take a look at the report. So this is important to look at because if one of the uh, runs of Trimmatic was to fail, you would see that in the report. The others might be successful, one might have failed. You also get a, um, a list of what the parameters were that were used for the run, as well as uh, a little bit of the results. Uh, so I'm just going to get rid of that and uh, concentrate now on the uh, actual uh, BL reads uh, uh, output that we got. So now you see that we've got some files uh, that are the original file names with the uh, addition of either a 1P or 1U, 2P, 2U, etc. These indicate the paired reads as well as the reads that couldn't be paired. So one reason, as I sort of in indicated before, that Trimmatic does this is if your assembly programs can't deal with reads where one pair, one part of the pair is missing, those are segregated out into a separate file. And most of the time, this represents a pretty small percentage of the total number of reads. And that's true here as well. So in the subsequent steps, we're going to ignore the unpaired reads. They just don't contribute enough information to be worth the mess that they can make uh, otherwise. So I want to uh, once again run guest pairs to select the uh, files that have only the paired reads, again R1 and R2 uh, distinguish the forward and reverse reads, and we'll use p.fastq as the file extension to uh, uh, separate out these files. So now we only have the paired read files and we're ready to run our next step 
which is read correction. Now, by the way, if I wanted to at this point, I could also be running FastQC to uh, just get uh, see whether the quality had changed in the reads. But for right now, we'll just uh, go on to the next step, which is correcting the reads. And uh, for that purpose, we have the R Corrector program that cor specifically is designed to correct RNA reads. And so, um, uh, in most cases, you can go with the defaults, although I am going to increase the number of threads. This machine, by the way, has eight CPUs. I'm going to use six of them. And um, the uh, 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 memory is, is uh, 16 gigabytes. So it's, it's, it's not a big machine, but it's a fairly substantial machine. And then note that the output is going to be sent to a new directory called reads.trimmed.rcorrector. I'm just going to change that to be a little bit more specific to Trimmomatic in case I wanted to com do one run with Trimmomatic, the other run with, with um, uh, Trim Galore, I would have the output going to different directories and then I could compare uh, the results if I wanted to. Uh, to just to speed things up, I'm going to turn off automatic uh, FastQC running on the corrected reads, and then I'm going to launch the program and we'll then take a look at the next output. So now you can see a new uh, BL Reads window with the uh, corrected reads. All of them have the .cor.fq file extension, and these are in the reads.trimmatic.rcorrector directory. So the next step now is we can finally do our uh, transcriptome assembly. And so we um, first of all have to group the files once again using guest pairs, and we use the .fq file extension to group them. And now we've got our pairs of uh, corrected read files ready for the assembly. So select those and now go to the transcriptome directory to do the uh, transcriptome assembly. We have three transcriptome assembly programs, RNA Spades, Soap De Novo, and Trinity. And today we'll do Trinity, uh, uh, Trinity assembly. So I just want to uh, make sure that we're use, using uh, 14 gigs out of our 16 of memory and then six out of our eight CPUs that are available. So we want to send output to a, um, a directory called reads.trimmomatic.rcorrector.trinity. And once we've got that set, we are ready to go. So we'll launch this, the assembly and then come back when the assembly is completed. So we finally have our output and we get of course, another BL Reads window with all of the uh, results from Trinity, as well as the trinity.log file that shows uh, how the uh, uh, assembly was done and gives us maybe just a little bit about the uh, final assembly. Now, we don't get a lot of information from that. Um, the final assembly itself, by the way, is in a uh, file called trinity.fasta. And there's some other FASTA files that um, uh, are produced by Trinity, but the main one that you want uh, for your uh, work is, is the trinity.fasta. Now, just having done this, we've got an assembly, but we still need to know uh, uh, how good the assembly is. So the last step in this process actually involves going back to the reads, the corrected reads that we used to make the assembly. And we want to run a program called TransRate that will give us a, a detailed report on the quality of the assembly. And so this will involve uh, going back to the original reads, reading all of them in again, and then also reading in this trinity.fasta file. So the transcriptome assembly uh, is what we have to choose. We have to go actually up one directory because these reads, remember, are in the trinity uh, reads.trimmatic.r corrector. So we need to go into the trinity output directory and grab uh, uh, the trinity.fasta file. So we'll be using 
these reads to evaluate the assembly in the trinity.fasta file. Now we don't have reference transcriptome or proteome to work with in this particular case. Uh, now one change in how things run when we're running transrate is that instead of creating a new transrate directory in the parent directory, we're going to send the output this time to a subdirectory of the uh, uh, reads.trimmatic.rcorrector.trinity uh, directory. So that makes sense because this transrate evaluation is specific for the assembly we've done. So, so that's why this time we're the, sending the output to a subdirectory of, of the uh, uh, of, of this directory where the uh, final assembly is uh, is found. So I'm going to launch transrate and then in uh, this will also be a fairly long running process. The assembly itself by the way took about four hours on this particular machine which is not a, at all a particularly powerful machine. <clears throat> on more powerful machines it would go more quickly. And so transrate will also take a while uh, to run. So we're going to start that and then we'll come back uh, later on when the assembly is complete or the, the evaluation is complete. So the output from in the transrate directory will come up in a new BL reads window and uh, of course the first file of importance is the transrate.log file which gives you quite a large number of statistics both on the contigs that were uh, created, whether they have open reading frames, the size distributions, as well as on how well the reads map to the uh, transcriptome. And so in particular you get things like the probability of a good read mapping, in this case was uh, 97 percent. And then at the end, the, all of these results are summarized in the transrate assembly score. So uh, based on the transrate publication, uh, a score of 0.57 is actually quite high, which especially is interesting when you remember that we're working with only about 5 percent of the total transcriptome reads in the original data set. So um, Trinity has done a good job of assembling this data. The same numbers can be found in spreadsheet form in the assemblies.csv file. And so uh, this also pops up and the file by itself is useful, but where it really becomes useful is when you start doing a number of assemblies. So you can paste the results from each assembly. Maybe you're comparing a Trinity assembly with an RNA spades assembly and a SOAP de novo assembly, and you can now start comparing results between the different programs or running the same programs with different parameters, and that is a very powerful approach to um, coming, uh, arriving at your uh, optimal uh, transcriptome assembly. Once you have a satisfactory transcriptome, BO Reads can use its power for ad hoc pipelining to let you run the tools necessary to generate the downstream data for differential expression. We don't have time to demonstrate these tools, but we can see that BO Reads uses uh, uh, programs such as HiSat build and GFF to GF, GTF uh, to generate your um, uh, index genome and then creates BAM files for the RNA reads using HiSat which then uh, are uh, mapped to the genes using string tie and then finally uh, ball gown to generate the spreadsheet files needed to do G differential expression work with uh, packages such as Bioconductor. So by the way, uh, the HiSat string tie ball gown uh, package supersedes the top hat bow tie cufflinks pipeline uh, which was originally written by the same authors. So we now uh, have a full pipeline going from raw RNA sequencing reads to differential expression. So the last topic I want to talk about is creating your own in-house BLAST databases. So we've already seen how Biolegado can run BLAST searches on local copies of a BLAST database. Now I want to show how easy it is to manage and install 
these databases using the BlastDB kit Python script. So you can add, delete, update databases, and get reports on disk usage, all from a single uh, set of BioLegato tools. So among the many features of the Birch administration tool, uh, there are tools for uh, administering your BlastDB databases. So first of all, we'll just take a look at how we find out what we've already got on our in our BlastDB uh, directory. And so one of the features is to just show the contents of our BlastDB uh, directories in a um, spreadsheet. And so you can see here, uh, my BLAST databases are in a directory called GenBank. And I've got two databases uh, listed here, the non-redundant nucleotide database and the SwissPro database. And so uh, oh, I guess the tax DD, DB database as well. So this also tells me how much disk space I have available, in this case about 351 uh, megabytes of, of data. So, so that um, tells me how much space I've got. And then if I want to consider installing some of the other databases, I can go to any of the three major repositories, NCBI, EBI, or the uh, uh, Human Genome Center in Tokyo, to find out um, how big each of the databases are going to be. So again, I get a spreadsheet very similar to what we just looked at that gives me a listing of all the different BLAST databases that are available and how big they would be once they're decompressed after downloading. Now, for demonstration purposes, I want to go to a pretty small one. So I'm going to use the PDB amino acid database, which 60 uh, megabytes to download and then uncompressed is 282 megabytes. If we go now to our Birch admin tool, I can add that uh, database to my uh, local databases by going to, um, again, choosing which site I want to download it from. I'll choose NCBI since I'm geographically closest to that one. And then in the protein tab, you'll see that if a database is already installed, it's got a plus, like Unipro we already have installed. I want to add the 3D protein database, so I'm going to click, I choose add here to add that database, and then I choose run. And so now uh, it just gives me a quick heads up. Yes, I do want to do this. And it will tell me that I'll get an email once the download is complete. So once the download is complete, I can check the uh, result by looking at, again at the local database. And uh, there we have our spreadsheet showing now that the uh, PDB amino acid database is present and uh, we have the most recent update. So this makes it very easy then to uh, manage your uh, different uh, uh, databases uh, in a relatively painless way. That concludes our quick overview of Birch and BioLegato. I want to make sure to thank the organizations that made this work possible, including Genome Prairie, Manitoba Innovation Energy and Mines, and the University of Manitoba. Birch is free open software that can be downloaded at the address above. Birch is free, but you pay for it by citing in your publications the software that you use. Without that software, your research would literally be impossible to do. Please check the Birch Bioinformatics YouTube channel for more videos on Birch. Thank you for watching.